this. So in, in, as a, an advocate of federalism and parliamentary government, and of federalism in particular, I have sought out the knowledge and information available <laughs> to this, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Other countries, federalist countries, have already got through a lot of experience in creating the federalism and in, in governing the federalism. So I have, I have had the, the benefit of uh, consulting you know, these knowledge and so on. <clears throat> and in, in all our proposals for federalism, we always uh, make comparisons. Try to, to be inspired and encouraged by the experience of other countries, especially unitary systems that have become federal, or unitary systems that are, in fact, already somewhat federal. <clears throat> and I have in mind uh, the examples of Spain, for example, uh, uh, Belgium, South Africa. Even the United Kingdom uh, is supposed to be uni unitary, but, <clears throat> but there's so much autonomy given to, to Scotland and Wales. So, like so from this, we are getting uh, uh, insights and encouragement. And we need these insights and encouragement because it is so frustrating to advocate charter change or institutional uh, structural change in our country. And why is this? Now, I should tell you that it will take two lifetimes. In my case, uh, uh, one whole lifetime is always done. <laughs> and, uh, and I started being an advocate of charter chairs in 1971. You know, I was the secretary of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, before the, third, the convention already decided to shift to parliamentary government and also to local autonomy. Things happening that frustrated them. And we are still at it. Now, last uh, January, I presented a paper in the Pena Conference on Peace in Mindanao. And for the first time, uh, we, we were with the government panel and the MILF panel. The first time that we, we were face to face with them. And so it was, it was uh, very interesting. But let me just put our discussion in, in this context. First of all, what is the political structure of our, of our country? Well, we are governed by a, a political oligarchy of family dynasties. And there's such a vested interest in the present structure. Uh, they're not likely to yield easily. Um, then we have also, uh, our society, our, our nation is divided into very distinct and very strong and very old uh, ethnic groups, ethnic, cultural, linguistic groups. We are a country where 15 major languages, not dialects, 15 major languages have survived through all the centuries. So, the Moros talk about the Pangsa Moro. We might as well say there is a Pangsa Ilocano, there is a Pangsa Ilocano, Pangsa Cebuana Visaya, etc. And uh, we may have uh, seven regions and so on. And, uh, and now, uh, and this, this is likely to, to continue. And uh, so the, there's this pluralism. And uh, then, if you look at the structure of society, we have the very rich and very powerful small group at the, at the top. A very thin middle class. And we are losing part of the middle class because of migration. And a large poor class, institute class. So poor, so insecure, so dependent on the oligarchs. So the oligarchs and the very poor so really have a symbiotic uh, relationship. And that also makes it even more difficult to, to change things. Uh, 
Um, so anyway, uh, in the 1971 Constitutional Convention, the idea of shifting to a parliamentary system was already agreed. It was a consensus, and uh, but not federalism, but, but aspects of, of local autonomy. But uh, until now, uh, uh, there has not been much. Uh, there's some, some progress. I, I would say that in the 1990s and the, since 2000, I've been writing con constitutional parts for federalism and, and, uh, and parliamentarism. Uh, and in 2005, I headed a presidential consultative commission to amend the proposed amendments to the Constitution. Also, we, we zeroed in on parliamentarism and federalism. But that was, that was the wrong leadership and the wrong time. Most unpopular uh, president we had. So our, our proposals sunk with that. And now we see the behind bars. So, so what are the prospects? I am encouraged by the 10 points that have been agreed by the two panels. It's still general, but uh, it is a clarification from the past, from the immediate past. Uh, the, the crucial issue is whether the leadership, the president himself, uh, will really agree to changing the constitution. That's basic. What is agreed upon in principle cannot be realized without changing the constitution. No way. So the president says it's not a priority to him. But so he, he's trying to massage the air of uh, talk about uh, the Samoro new entity and so on. But the, 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 the crucial test is whether they are willing to charge, change the charter. And uh, in Penang, and even before the Penang countries, I have always been batting in favor of federalism, amongst more autonomy. Because what is good for the Moros is good for all of us, for all the Bangsas that make up uh, the Philippines. So we are very encouraged with this. Okay, you, you, you know, you have to have firepower, you have to, to be able to, to get the attention of, of the national government. But then, the thing is, charter, when the charter be yeah, really amended. And so we await that, uh, to me, that is the, the, the real test. And uh, so we need uh, the support of all uh, the Bangsas, all Filipinos all over the country, asserting their regional autonomy. That's the only way we can persuade the oligarchs headed by the chief oligarch, President Aquino, <laughs> to change uh, our constitution. So I, I would like this to happen within my lifetime. I'm in my 80s now. Uh, this month I'll be 84. Uh, and this, uh, this is the last decade, normally. <laughs> Even with the longevity of, of, of the young Filipinos, or present generation. So those are the realities that I'd like to share with you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's always nice to be with President of Puebla. And sir, my father, he was 100 and he's still as strong as possible. <laughs> he was this year, centennial man. Anyway, uh, <laughs> see, serious, the centennial man of UP was my uncle. And the centennial man of UST is his, uh, my father in law. Right. So, sir, you're part of them. <laughs> you can see them how strong uh, JVA is. Uh, for me, always the press, our, our president. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for this very uh, uh, enlightening uh, presentation. Yes, we have worked with you. I don't know, you, we work with IPAC, of course, the International Public Appreciation of Canada, and also with the Formal Federation. And about uh, a decade and a half ago, we organized what we call the International Conference on decentralization, putting the focus on federalism. We had a, a number of, of, of very good publications out of that, which really found its way into the advocacy for federalism. But as pointed out by Dr. Weber, uh, I guess we, it, it, I guess we, might, we, we 
Mohammed being pumped, if you may, because when uh, President Gloria was done, who started, I would not say hijacking the, the <laughs> ideology, it, it has gone down. But anyway, the, 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 the advocacy for federalism continues. I remember we were still in Padre Power a long, long time ago, in the 80s, and we were already talking about that. So I guess, for me, looking at federalism and local governance, I think there is no one size fits all. And the way I think we should, uh, or the way we have been framing federalism, at least in the Philippine context, is within the context of devolution and autonomy. We, we have said that federalism is the next logical step after devolution. Of course, you can have federal systems where you don't have strong local governments, but given the Philippine context, we feel that, yes, we have a very devolved framework in 1991, but we feel to push it further, the federal, uh, federal system will provide a stronger, more hospitable enabling framework for devolution, i.e. stronger local governments. Because we believe that indeed, strong local governments is the key quote unquote, for development. So that, that's the first point. It should really be located within the framework of devolution, at least within the Philippine context. And I think you mentioned that also in your presentation when you talk about the experience of other countries from Belgium, Spain, Ethiopia, Australia, uh, Switzerland. We have learned a lot from Canada. I must say we've had a number of study visits to you and also to Australia and even to Malaysia. I mean, the whole point here is that when we talk about federalism, we look at the experience of other countries. As a matter of fact, in a few days, we have a group of uh, high-level officials from Nepal. Nepal just adopted the federal system, which is really strange because they, they invited us to go there and talk about our federal structure. And, and now, they're, now they, they're coming here to learn about our, us. And we've told them, you know, you look at it from the framework of the evolution. In a few days, they shall be here. But they now have an enabling framework, i.e. a constitution, but they now have to strengthen the local governments. That is what they'll be coming here. But the point being, learning from uh, international experience and obviously the FOF, of which you were once president, really is, uh, has really uh, brought all these ideas together. And I think at one point, uh, at one point I say we, we continue to draw upon the materials of that. Okay, in your presentation, sir, you, you also mentioned some of the major issues. And, and I think they, they, they range from, among others, the ethnic factors, which is quite, quite, can be very emotional, as you know, uh, the, as, a, as an instrument for peace. This is what Senator Pimentel has always talked about, uh, a federal structure, i.e. for the region, to bring about as, uh, the enabling framework for conflict, if you may. You talk about uh, <clears throat> the, the importance of defining territorial arrangements. Well, I'll go back to this in a while, particularly that, that on devolution, that on uh, uh, the, uh, as a management issue, the symbolism aspect and control over resources, etc. But let me focus on the two things that you zeroed in also. One is on finance. Yes, we can talk federalism till we are blue in the face, but I think as scholars, we, we have to really do our assignments. How much if we're talking taxation? What is there a formula for sharing? What is the transfer? Right now in the Philippines, when we talk about uh, under our devolution framework, we have a, a formula for transfers from national to local. And it's a very state formula. I mean state in the sense that I don't think it was right, but we were all part of it in one sense. We talk about population, land area, and equal sharing. And uh, that doesn't really mean much. So we're actually right now uh, calling for the re revision of the local government code to focus on two things. Shall we introduce, say, a poverty index? Shall we introduce, say, performance? And who should, who, who should do this? At one point, we brought a group of people to Australia. And who does this? Is it the national government? I know, for instance, in Australia, they have a grants commission, which is uh, separate from, apart from. Silapo, they're the ones to determine how much are the transfers. And each subnational government, uh, quote unquote, defense uh, advocates these transfers. But the point is, and I, I agree with you, sir, the very important aspect of really looking at the specifics. My colleague and friend, I don't know, some of you might know him, his name is Terry Domoko, when we were going around the country talking about federalism, he actually came up with figures. How much will you expect from your transfers if you have a federal structure? And these were good figures, and I think as scholars we should really do that. Going beyond the rhetoric, come up with the uh, solid uh, evidence, but that's, that, including, as you, as you mentioned earlier, control over resources, which could be a very, very emotional issue, as you know. In the Philippines, as uh, you might know, uh, the issue of resources has zeroed in on uh, the 40%, uh, 40 percent to be owned by the local government and 60 percent. So if the resource is drawn from you, 40 percent is either automatically retained or plowed back to you. Again, uh, I don't know if that might have been a weakness on our part, but in one sense we were very, very formula driven, and here we are talking about no one size fits all, but apparently we were doing the one size fits all as far as uh, 
uh, devolution is concerned. But those are the two very, very important issues, I think, that you zeroed in as far as uh, linking uh, federalism, at, at least from my perspective, the importance to link federalism as a next step towards devolution. The other issues, of course, when we talk about federalism would be uh, the extent to which uh, the quote-unquote capacities, of course, you have, I know I've read your books, that of James Watts, etc., where they talk about what is what is national, what is uh, local, what are what are shared, etc. This this all have to have to come in. But for me, now I think it's a very very special case, no. And uh, I think the symbolic aspect. My friend and colleague, his name is Sukarno Tangol, whom I invited here. He just came up actually with a book on again uh, zeroing in on uh, autonomy in. in Mindanao. Two of them, uh, Professor Mac Muslim, who is right now the president of Mindanao State U, and, and Sukarno Tangol, have really been looking at it. And that maybe federalism would be one enabling framework that might finally address this, of course, in accordance to the Constitution, which will have to change eventually, and of course, uh, in accordance to the whole ideology that Senator Pimentel has always been talking about. I mean, Senator Pimentel is also in his uh, late 70s. He set up what's called the Piment they set up what's called the Pimentel Institute for Local Governance, and among the other aspects that they continue, we continue to do research that is on federalism. So with that, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to make this uh, very quick uh, uh, reaction, but really, just to say, um, uh, summarize one, it is the, 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 the next logical step after the evolution. Let's push it, let's push it. Number two, we have to do our homework. We have to do with uh, our own uh, specific computations and uh, go beyond the uh, rhetoric, come up with uh, uh, the evidence, if you may, of what will be retained, resource sharing, etc., etc. Because at the end of the day, it's really, as we said earlier, strengthening, uh, empowering our local communities, which I think federalism might be able to really provide a uh, context for. Marami pong salam. Well, um, first of all, I'd like to thank our speakers for staying within the time, uh, which gives us a lot of time for discussion now. Um, but just just as a quick uh, way of trying to, to, to put things in perspective, um, I think uh, among the things that actually came out of the uh, uh, of the talks, uh, and, and this goes with, with, with what uh, uh, Mr. Anderson actually talked about, no? is that, um, and, and I think both uh, Dr. Abueva and, and Dr. Villantes uh, uh, actually uh, addressed the uh, points as well, is the issue of the difference between uh, symbolic and functional uh, concerns. No? Symbolic ones seem to be very, very uh, uh, problematic as far as trying to, to address them. No? And, and uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, the language issues actually come in, the territorial issues actually come in as well. No? But um, I think what came out in, in, in the first part of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, presentations was the need to address the specifics of the functional concerns as well, specifically the finance aspects. No? Um, and, and this actually uh, uh, came out in what uh, Dr. Villates was actually talking about, in trying to focus on that particular point. No? But at the same time, if we go back to what Dr. Abueva said, one interesting thing that he actually pointed out was the importance of the politics as well, that in the end, all of these things will depend on you know, presidential, the, the, the political leadership you know, that will be responsible for pushing the whole issue uh, uh, together. You know? um, so with that, I'd like to open the discussion um, at, uh, to the floor, you know, and I'd be welcoming uh, uh, questions from, uh, from the audience, you know, uh, which I'm sure our, our uh, uh, speakers will be more than happy to uh, uh, talk about. Um, We'll see how it works out, but I'm actually thinking in terms of collecting uh, uh, clusters of questions, no, um, so that we can extend this discussion. No? Okay, so uh, with that, could I invite uh, questions now? Yes, please. Uh, there is a mic here. You, uh, we'd appreciate it if you could introduce yourself and your uh, affiliation. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Rafael Montes. I'm a graduate of political science, but I work at NCPAC. <laughs> I used to be a project leader of a federalism cooperation program with the Institute of Federalism in Switzerland. And just like Dr. Brillante said, we work with the Forum of Federations. We actually know some of your colleagues there. Uh, my question is because uh, we are actually doing a, sort of a, an assessment of local democracy in, in the ARMM right now. And initial, yeah. find, yes, initial, initial findings of uh, the survey that we did was that people thought that democracy in, in, in the ARMM was different 
differently implemented for the rest of the country. And then there is uh, another finding that uh, people think that democracy is compatible with Islam, but then there are the elites in in the Muslim community, in the Bansamara community, like the religious leaders and the traditional leaders who think otherwise. Uh, so uh, my question is because in the Philippines, the design of uh, the ARMM has always conformed to the, nationals, the, the same structure that the national government is following. Even the democratic institutions there are the same, uh, following the national design. Uh, uh, how then would I mean, I would just be curious how your input would be in in determining with the, the the inputs that we find out found out from the survey that there is seemingly this conflict between their idea of democracy and also the idea of those people who still define uh, part of the discourse in, in the ARN. Other questions? Please, yes. Good morning. Uh, I am Sir Agnes, and I'm connected with FDU. Uh, Dr. Abueva mentioned a while ago that the structure of the Philippine government is, is actually influenced by family dynasties and powerful groups at, at the top. And in relation to this, the question is, what if all Bangsa or provinces in the Philippines would support federalism, and we were able to change the unitary system, we're able to shift the unitary system to federal system of government, and the same oligarchs, the same families, will still run the, the system, will dominate the system, what changes do we expect from federal system of government? Thank you very much. I'll entertain one more question before going back to our speakers. We used to have a maintenance studies program, but we have evolved with UPE. Anyway, my question is, would the federal set up uh, help in keeping the resources of Mindanao for Mindanao Rose, or it will easily extract the resources from Mindanao? And we go to the national board. So, um, could I ask our uh, speakers to address the questions that were directly direct that were directed at them, uh, or whichever ones that you might want to uh, talk about? Uh, thank you. If, if I may, I'm going to take a minute just also to comment a bit on on the commentators. So we'll start with the dialogue. <laughs> and, uh, the um, I, I think one of the you know, with the way. One of the things you see in, in the political science literature, uh, which Dr. Weber will be very aware of, is this concept of federal societies versus federal political systems. And I think his comments very much indicate that in this, if you're just standing back and looking at the Philippines, you'd have to say this is a federal society. Uh, the combination of the plurality that he described in terms of, of peoples and languages, but also the fact that you're an island country. Uh, you, you have a much easier problem when you come to boundaries, with the exception perhaps of the two big islands, uh, in terms of what would you know what would be the shape of the federation. Uh, you mentioned uh, Nepal. Uh, the big big problem they had in Nepal, and we'll see whether they they actually get this baby uh, out of the operating room, uh, is uh, on boundaries uh, because there was no natural boundaries in Nepal and. Uh, uh, but, but I would say this is a naturally federal country that as you democratize, sooner or later, whether it be one, two, or lifetimes, or I don't know what, but sooner or later one would have thought there would be a push to federalize this country. But getting the ducks in the line and its a combination of, of political leadership and, and, and a window uh, where it could be, you can manage the operation within electoral cycles and everything else. Um, the other comment I'd make before I get into the more specific things is you know, there's a tremendous variety of, elector of, parliament of, of federalist systems. I mean, when people talk about federalism, it's not as though there is a model. Every country has adopted its own model. And e even when you adopt a model, it evolves after it's been adopted. So, uh, and, and sometimes in surprising ways. I mean, within the United States uh, and Australia were designed to be 
devolved federations have both have really evolved over time in a much more centralizing direction. Canada was designed to be a centralized federation and has evolved in the other direction. But at least you have a framework within which these, the, the political forces could, could play out. Uh, in, but in terms of the major differences between federations, I mean, there is